This one kid got knocked out, saw fucked up like a boxed house, locked doors, windows blocked out. One punch, these tough images cropped out. Flip the kill switch, and all that chill shit, they knock out. These dudes got a short fuse like a thought blouse. Locked in death to them stop shouts. Niggas the type to shoot first, all questions crossed out. That little buddy slept bloody than snot mouth. Where was y'all at though? Right on the corner by the old food truck, cold. They took his chains and boots off, socks out. Head hit like face first, blood on his stained shirt. His wallet whipped out, that's pay dirt. And quickly picked up by the same perk. People's phones out, now they filming in frame burst. Whole scene sucks, but it's way worse. Little kids watching, now they cursed. Cycles that we live in, it's apes, sir, I'm saying. Then a flare spark, light up, right there, see the whole thing different. Full view, T, no shade visible. Listen, look again, breathe, rotate, pivotal. I figure these just words y'all gon' take literal. I rock out mineral. Who wants some bullshit? Minimal. Y'all clowns gon' need prayers after I kill a few. My skills damaging, right down to the ego shattering. Probably not real if you're not a fan of us. I shoot from deep hit, free throw average. I'm stress free, yes please. We blow cannabis like Gretzky. I triple check these old analysts. The game's slow, y'all drag on. I dethrone Lannisters. They repo, but it's light work. I'm reprogramming it. Zoom lens got three whole cameras. Life bitchy, cause you suck. Probably you can't handle it. We fucking, we looking through a peephole, amateur. December 18th, and this is another episode of How Billy Sees It, yo. And it's episode two of season two, and I decided to move it, change the the usual song I have at the top, my newest joint, Perspective. Um, uh, I really fuck with that song. I like that a lot. I'm really proud of myself with the music. But anyway, look, we are here. Thank you for being here. How Billy Sees It. Um, this is episode 61. It's crazy that we had episode 61 already. Uh, started uh, talking on my phone on on Instagram lives and then transitioned to this about two years ago and um, so excited about the different conversations we've been able to have and then I fell off for a little bit needed a break needed a break and um, then things got even fucking weirder <laughs> and I said I gotta get back on let's talk let's talk about things you know I did that last week and so this is the second. Uh, app, as I've said, and I'm amped for it. Um, we're in the holiday season, middle of December, and um, you know, it's funny being in the holiday season as an adult, man. It's just totally different from from uh, being a kid. You have this kind of light, uh, loose association with the world. You know, each each day is whatever it is, and Christmas was our thing growing up, so we. We would uh, do the Christmas thing. We'd ask for presents, and mom would get a couple of the presents. Dad would get a couple. Stepdad would get some presents. Um, and sometimes we do a thing with family. Some of the cousins would come over. The ones in Philly, that was always cool when we were much younger. Um, and the world was wild back then too. I think the world was wild back then too. But um, now, as an adult, it's. It feels like it's even wilder, but in, in truth, what it is is, you know, I feel like we're stepping into this role of being able to, like, observe it all the way adults can, the way a child typically can. And then further, we're observing it. This generation of adults has access to so much. The social media, the direct connections with each other through the Internet has produced a different level of awareness about what goes on in the world. All this stuff. And... It requires a different, it, 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 you know, I, I think the way it evolves us, it evolves everything. The communication modes have sped up. The efficiency of our um, 
the way we process information there's so much information being sped up and I think it evolves us in an interesting way and we evolve it and there's a mirror going back and forth um, even down to the efficiency of language we call it like emojis and uh, LOLs and things like this like that this is just common and you know back in the day words you know there was a um, there was some credit and value to having being able to speak I don't know obviously there's still value to being able to speak multiple languages that's not what I'm trying to point to um I just think there's something about like the ability to for us all to uh, print and put our information, our ideas on paper, and to record ourselves like this. Um, it's game changing, and it means that we're able to get more out. It means that people who had to sort of write with a pen and a quill or something only, you know, and they needed only sunlight. There was no light in the evening. Um, that each of those moments, uh, there was some. lack that produced an intensity around the writing and now people have the ability to just say whatever and some people still approach writing with an intensity what I want to say when I when I talk about intensity I mean like they approach writing with an effort to to share something meaningful to share something that they with, with the world something of meat and heft you know um, and what that means is going to be different for everyone I'm, I, I have my own judgments on what that means but everyone has a different thing and I want to accept all that what I'm saying though is you know free Wi-Fi and high speed internet and everybody having a high speed computer in their, in their pockets um, we produce a lot of just stuff just words just words just spewing things we found these little markets and pockets and these little incentives to be seen and be heard, whether or not we're saying something meaningful, hefty, useful, beneficial, something from love, something with, with, real, with real value. You can contrive value out of anything, including separation. You can contrive with, you know, you can, with enough attention and enough fervor you can make an argument for almost anything and, and and because the words are so cheap <laughs> you can do it some people can do it the, the most innovative among us can do it the most connected among us can build platforms for themselves and just say all kinds of stuff and I think that's an interesting thing and I think it's I think it's changing this is something I want to point to I think that we talk about words sometimes. So this episode is about words, by the way. We're going to talk about words. I think sometimes we talk about words as though um, there's no, they're just these ephemeral things. They just, you say them and then they go off and they disappear. And again, as I said, they're so cheap now. There's no, uh, very effortlessly we can put together a manuscript or write stuff and, and share ideas that I think our generations past would have been a lot of effort to reach a thousand people with an idea. And so what an amazing privilege that then we immediately, or not immediately, but over time, even within a generation, but definitely through generations, over time, that difference is lost. That, that new realm isn't even really felt or considered anymore. That that space of the ability to just kind of throw words out cheaply, <laughs> easily. And that's a feature of something I want to talk about. So we're talking about words. And, and the reason I wanted to talk about words is um, I, I'm i interested in the topic. I'm interested in the topic of, of words and linguistics. I've been talking on this show about lots of different things in relation to words. And... Um, I think I can tie some things together today. Uh, it's it's particularly front of mind for me because we're in the middle of uh, by now it's sixty days of intense violence in uh, the Middle East, in Gaza, and now also in the West Bank, and also other skirmishes and 
um, rising tensions and violence, bombing of infrastructure um, in Lebanon and other parts of that region. And all of these things are, they build on each other and they have the capacity to, whatever is happening now has the capacity to balloon into further and more things. Things that can't be predicted. Some things that can be predicted, frankly. But it's important to use, I think, the right words to point at what we're doing and what the world is and what is in the moment so that we can assess it properly and that we can chart the right path to avoid further harm, to avoid growing escalations and you know consequences, consequences that no one seems to want. No one really seems to want, I think. Except for some crazy fucking people, maybe. Yeah, th those people exist too. Anyway, a friend of mine, I was post. I've been posting about Palestine, and a friend of mine uh, challenged me on the. Several people I have actually challenged me on the word genocide. Uh, there is a genocide occurring um, at the moment. Several genocides, but this, this in particular in Palestine has captured. The American attention because the United States is deeply embedded in this, not just in the current moment with the bombs and the weapons and the and the money sent to Israel and the diplomatic support for Israel, but also over the last several decades, the diplomatic support, um, the supposed different peace talks that have occurred, and the yearly consistent contributions and support for the state of Israel. So we're, we, we can't, like, we can't distance ourselves from, like, as a nation, let's say, we can't distance ourselves from our role in the creation of what currently is. And what currently is is a genocide. And I've said that. And so I get a couple of people who either in my DMs or on my comments on Facebook have come to me and said, it's not a genocide. Mm, I don't think it's, mm, could you consider a different word? Come on, you, you want to be careful before you use words like genocide. And I ended up having these different conversations with different people. I'm having these conversations. I'm, I, I enjoy to some degree like hashing out what they mean when they say this stuff and what, what they're intending. And it's helped, and those conversations help me understand how this thing works. And it helps me further understand how words work and how they're employed. Um, we have to look at words fully. We have to understand that everything is way more complex than we think they are. So, I mean, I could go on a whole thing about that. Everything is way more complex than we think they are. But on the matter of words, yo, words are not just words. When I grew up, I was taught about words and sentences. You have your nouns and your verbs and um, adjectives. <laughs> and then you have different words like nouns, um, will then typically have a definition of a sort. And so you look at the definition to understand the noun. And so what is a definition? A definition is just more words, right? A definition is more words, hopefully other words, that we employ in order to define the word. And so it's words on top of words, on words of words. <laughs> and as I said, you, you might think that they're just, bleh, bleh, they're just ephemeral. There's just a thing to do, but words are deeper than that. And they're very powerful. Words exist to be spoken. They exist to be spoken. Why else would they exist if not to be spoken? Right? Uh, let me read these comments here. My baby says perspective is for fire emojis love seeing your evolution glad you're back thanks babe lol it's like sometimes it's a genocide that's the world we created so gotta be able to call a spade a spade when we name it what well, we can do something about it words on words on words yes <laughs> words on words on words um words exist to be spoken yo and they as I said they oh they, they want to encapsulate something in the real world words were created by humans. They are human constructions. They are tools. They are technology. And again, because we are the recipients of words as children, privileged on top of the shoulders and the struggles of so many generations of, of, of people and humans, 
and development of language and anthropological, you know, cultural developments. We just receive that. And so we're not, we don't even appreciate it anymore. We don't appreciate what words are. And if some of you already feel me when I say that, but to really understand it, like, you know, I think Bill Burr has that great joke. Is it Bill Burr or Louis C.K. <laughs> does a joke about um, being on an airplane and how people should nonstop. We should just be like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, I'm in a flying bird and it's fly and it's getting me to my destination, a destination that in prior generations, it would have taken me. It would have taken me three generations to get across this thing over here. Several people would have died. And we'd be and, and, and it would be the children of the of the other people who started the journey who would have gotten there. Now we get there in an hour and a half. And somehow they got Wi-Fi. And somehow they give us a movie. <laughs> and they give us food sometimes. The food is a little, you know. It's not the best stuff, but it's it's edible. And you be hungry when you you know you be hungry when you get it. I love them little peanuts. <laughs> Listen. And yet, with all that I just said, if you really sit and think about that technology and that process, that, 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 the, the, the ability to fly with regularity and with a degree of safety, with a degree of assuredness that you can get to your other place, we should constantly be like, what the fuck? But we're not. In fact, you're like pissed off because the Wi-Fi is not working. You're mad because obviously the seat, you got the middle seat. You're mad because it was delayed. It was delayed an hour. Oh no, it was delayed an hour. Maybe 15 fucking minutes it was delayed. Maybe the Wi-Fi, you gotta press a couple things. You gotta, it's it's piss, it's like, it's annoying that you gotta, you gotta hit this and that. Oh, why do I have to do all that? Why can't I get my movie? I just wanna watch my movie. And that's just, there's something about us and the nature of humans that we experience the moment. And once we step into an experience and accept what is, it becomes entirely natural to us. It becomes entirely, we, we don't even feel it. We don't even observe it any longer. It becomes natural. And then the loss of it becomes some big uh, encroachment on your either on your rights or on your freedoms, certainly on your, you know, your enjoyment. And words are like that. Words are like that. It's another one of those things. You have to really put yourself in the shoes of a, a much older person, an ancestor of the human race. Many, 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 many generations ago when there were fewer words there was fewer communication and there were language barriers and gaps and it was a challenge to explain and identify certain things. So words are created as needed. You know what I'm saying? Words, words develop whenever a civilization, a society, a group of people um, come across a new problem. A new problem arises or a new experience is brought about. They arrive at a new, something that changes the paradigm that they were currently in that sometimes you don't have a word for it. And genocide is one of those things, explicitly. Explicitly. The word genocide was invented in the 1940s. And let me pull this up, y'all. <clears throat> okay here's the un website on genocide prevention the word genocide was first coined by polish lawyer Raphael lemkin in 1944 in his book axis rule in occupied europe it consists of the greek prefix genos uh, meaning race or tribe and the latin suffix side uh cide i don't know side <laughs> meaning killing um, Lemkin developed the term partly in response to the Nazi policies of system, systematic murder of Jewish people during the Holocaust, but also in, pre in response to previous instances of history, in history of targeted actions aimed at the destruction of particular groups of people. 
Later on, Ralph Raphael Lemkin led the campaign to have genocide recognized and codified as an international crime. Okay? Um, now, this is not even necessarily the definition. We'll get to the definition here. The definition is A, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm to the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children from of the group to another group. Okay, so, okay, here it is. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group as such. Okay? Um... So you have the word genocide, and then you have this definition, and it says any of the following acts, right? And so what we have in Palestine is this easily. The, it fits easily. You look at the, the wording of it, and you realize that it's worded this way with intention. Some people look at the wording and say, oh, it's too loose. Oh, come on. Anything could be. It's worded with the intention to prevent these kinds of events and in the international community in journalism in law in philosophy these words are constantly being challenged and fought over the definitions and the meanings and the applications of these words genocide is a word which has the intent let me come back to full screen for a second genocide is a word where the intent is to to cause alarm, to compel international attention, and, and, and to compel political, diplomatic, legal means to stop whatever is happening. It is a it is intentionally that. Um and so when I get the uh messages in the comments to use a different word, I reject that. I won't use a different word. I will call it what it is. And I need to call it what it is because for exactly the reasons. See, if I, if I, not only is that definition applicable here, but more important than just the definition, which is, as I said, is a marshalling of other words to define the word. The word exists with a political truth behind it. The word exists with the goal of preventing violence, acts of violence on the global stage. The word exists so that when it's used, everyone has to stop. It makes very clear who the perpetrator and the victim are. And it makes us stop, look, and immediately begin to consider alternative options to what's going on. That's why the world, the word exists. And so when I get into a conversation with someone who wants to suggest that the word genocide doesn't apply because there aren't enough deaths, for instance, you're wrong. You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't know, like, you, you, you need to measure that and calculate that. And, and I wonder how you'll do it because, of course, if we're looking at different ethnic groups and, 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 and states and peoples, you know, how will you measure that? You can't use a raw number for how many deaths it would, it would equate to a genocide. You have to talk about some percentage, perhaps. You have to talk about per, per 100,000 people in order to, in order to, um, to protect smaller groups. So it's not, it's not that. It's not about a number. And it's not about those other words. It's not about killing members. Yeah, killing members of the group. It's there. It's present. So why, why hold back from using that word? They struggle with that. These same people will say, yeah, that's the definition, but, but it's too loose. Well, you, so here's the definition. and you, Why is it too loose? Why, you need to accept it then. But further than that, more important than meeting... The, the definition in this document, the context of what words are, words are not just 
sounds and letters and things that we're pointing to that we have to define and measure words operate within a context for specific reasons and especially this word which is a political word which was created in 19 in the 1940s and thank you it was created in the 1940s in response to an atrocity in response to something terrible that we don't ever want to see happen again thank you it was created it was it was ostensibly morally upright people who were looking at something and in fact it stated a crime without a name is a phrase that was used around the time to describe what was going on what Hitler was doing in Germany a crime without a name literally google it and so we have a name thank you <clears throat> so we have to understand what words are <clears throat> every day when you're watching the news again in the journalistic space in the legal space in international relations space every single word is poured over and is chosen with specificity and with purpose and you see people having long conversations and back and forths about certain words trying to ascertain its meaning and trying to um win the right to use a certain word in a certain context words like terrorist apartheid civilian refugee combatant war crime defense versus offense indigenous occupation racism anti-semitism anti-islamism anti-islamism sit you know sit you know just that's all in the sort of international space but we just finished or we're not finished we're sort of we just dealt with a protracted discussion on gender so cisgender man and woman the idiots at daily wire have a movie called what is a woman preoccupied with the word you see preoccupied distracting us having us define this word in an interesting way instead of looking at people looking at what is and learning to communicate and accept and deeply experience each other beyond things like this you following me yeah yeah i believe you i know you are all right whatever is going on out there doesn't really matter like i can describe horrendous atrocities in that part of the world we are all like if you're watching this you know i am at you're safe and what an amazing privilege that you don't even always accept and realize to to wake up in a condition of general safety and freedom generally to get up and pursue your own interests and come up with interesting things to do and then to be able to pursue them it's a brilliant thing but the the words we use whatever's going on out there is terrible and the words we use are simply reflections of us they tell us who we are and what we're thinking and what we're feeling if you're someone who doesn't want to use the word genocide in this moment there's a complex political equation there's a complex personal equation and a complex ego that that blocks this it um you don't want to you don't want to have to make a sentence that includes that word you don't want to have to consider what it means you know the word genocide comes with the implication it comes with the requirement for people to act and stop like i said you don't want to have to consider what it means who you might have to stand up to what institutions and people you might have to speak differently to and about uh you, <laughs> you don't want to speak too soon right there's a ton of people using the word there's a ton of people globally assessing it clearly and directly but then there's a community of of like insider people who 
for again a whole bunch of reasons their own personal interests um their own professional interests they have an aversion to they don't want to be first to call this out to call it what it is even though you're not going to be first they don't want to be early is what i mean really um what an interesting thing to not want to be early on on the on the genocide but if that's the if that's how we operate, we're looking around to, to, to figure out what everybody else, you know, what, what's the comfortable thing here? What does it mean? How would you have to report on a country that's carrying out a genocide? One that has been operating an open air prison for several decades. One that the, the regime leader has just recently been honest for the first time in a long time with or well, the first time ever I don't know been honest publicly in English about the role he's played in denying the um, the Palestinians any statehood he's kept it a buck he's kept it a buck so he's denied every political he's, cho- he's ch- choose and used every political and military trick possible to prevent statehood and he's proud of that fact and his political philosophy was one of oppression and one of we can subdue them. We can put them into submission and make partnerships with the global world and just kind of keep them there. And this has made everyone less safe and it's backfired. <laughs> and now we have a terrible problem on our hands. And we have all this deeper mythology where we can't call things what they are. I posted um, earlier about uh, the trolley problem, and I just want to run through the trolley problem real quick on this, so you can see. Huh? It didn't come up. Y'all know what the trolley problem is, yo? The trolley problem is a hypothetical uh, problem that. It's a hypothetical philosophy problem. So let me let me come up with this real quick. Bing. All right, so here's the, here's the trolley problem, yo. You are this guy right here. You have a lever that uh, controls the switch on this trolley. The trolley coming across this way. Can you see my, my mouse? Huh, I don't know if you can see my mouse. The trolley that's straight, If the trolley currently, if you just go straight, it's going to run over five people. But if you hit that lever switch, it will turn it so that it only runs over one person and so the the moral problem here is do you let if you do nothing this kind of violence will occur for five people but you can say i did nothing um for the top one you would uh if you you switch the lever you'd kill this person up here the one person but you will have played an active role you would have played an active role in potentially saving five people but harming one person who otherwise wouldn't have been harmed without your active role and so it's a philosophy question it's a it's a very simplistic and fun and interesting philosophy question that if you were this person who what is the moral thing to do here be passive and do nothing and let five people die or be active and do and harm another person maybe you know it it, what it does is it plays with all of your all of the ways you think about Morality. This is a simple, so simple five versus one. Oh, this is fewer people. Okay, let me do that. But then there's this this active choice. There's this active element in you switching that puts you in a different realm. You know, in the you know in our legal sense, in a legal sense, uh, if you don't press the thing and the thing runs over five trolleys, you didn't you didn't do anything. You're not called into court for that. You were just there. You didn't start the trolley off you didn't tie those people up i don't even know why those people there but in the second move if you did shift the lever and kill the first guy i think legally you would put yourself in jeopardy right so these are the these are the kind of plays that are happening with the trolley problem there's been a lot of little flips on the trolley problem uh let me see this one this one says Oh no, a trolley is heading towards five people. You can pull the lever to divert it to the other track 
sending the trolley into the future to kill five people a hundred years from now, what do you do? You see, so now this adds an element of time to it. Um, you pull that lever, it goes to the future. Those people are saved. You, in a hundred years, you won't be around, right? A hundred years, some other five people just have a trolley drop on them randomly because you did this. <laughs> are you morally wrong, you know? So it's, a, it's another interesting one. Um, and here's my point. The trolley stuff, people have come up with this trolley thing and they, they, they run it to death. They love to, there's countless other ones, you know, you know or dozens other ones that people come up with. Um, but we're faced with a moral dilemma in the moment. We're faced with a meaningful moral dilemma in the moment. And the more, most, the, 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 the sooner more of us are able and willing and capable of calling this what it is, it's as if we have a lever and we're diverting the track. Because right now, I think we're looking at something like 19,000, if not 20,000 civilians dead in Palestine, Palestinians. You have 10,000 or better children. The nature of the indiscriminate bombings are, are, are clear, can't really be dismissed. It's all there for you. Um, but saying the word, calling it what it is, as I said, it is a word with the goal of having everyone stop and look at what we're doing. And instead, we just have a situation where people are unwilling, frightened for their own, whatever their construction is, their identity construction, their sense about what the world is. Their sense about the definition of the word genocide, even though it applies, I've just shown you the definition. Their sense of the political ramifications, the political, you know, what it means. What would you have to say to the Biden administration? What would you have to say to an administration who was not just giving diplomatic support, but giving financial and military support to a regime? that was very publicly racist in their <laughs> in their orientation and, and displayed all kind of disdain for the population and are pulling off a violent, heinous act in a region that they occupy. Undermining international law, undermining all those institutions that we've been building as valuable as a way to safeguard ourselves against this tendency to separate <clears throat> and it's so funny it's so terrible it's a terrible irony that the nation state Israel which was built from that era of the past of the other European genocide that was so formative you know when I thought about violence and I thought about the worst crimes in the world the Holocaust <clears throat> and Hitler was top of the line um, it's a terrible irony to see Israeli government and Israeli some citizens people just <laughs> willing to undermine these these very institutions just a couple generations later. It's wild, actually. Let me check the comments real quick. Sheba says, yeah, why have words if we're not going to use them? That's right. You got to use them. They're there for that. Sheba says, oh, can we, LOL, can we, we can adapt to almost any experience. It's true. Sheba says, crimes against humanity was coined to describe King Leopold's treatment of the Congolese people. White men are notorious for expanding our collective understanding of the possibilities of violence. Yeah, yeah. Before then, it's like, what do you call that? He's just killing, he's killing. Oh, he's killing more people again. Well, then you have to... <laughs> we'll get into to some more stuff on words. Creating a word for genocide has not seemed to do much to prevent other genocides. What more can we do to harness the power of language, inspiring action to better and prevent future genocides? It's a great question, Shiva. <clears throat> and I think I want to get into that in this next half we're at like the half hour or oh no i'm 40 minutes oh shit 
We're at 40 minutes. The next 20 minutes I want to spend to answer that question, Sheebs, okay? What else can we do? And I love the way you phrased it. What more can we do to harness the power of language? Because there's lots of things we can do. There's things, you know, organizations you can, you know, support financially, organizations you can join and give your time to, ways to speak out, but you're talking about specifically how to harness the power of language, okay? So I'm with that. Uh, let me Trust me, I'll get to that. Next question. The key is to get a big group of people, some to slow down the trolley while others untie the people in the track. <laughs> yeah, baby. Okay, yeah. See, teamwork makes the dream work. Multiple hands do light work or something like that. I love that. Great analogy. More of us have to agree that it's time to act. Yes, we do. Okay, okay. So let me get into this next part. Yeah, let me get a sip of water first. A sip of water. A sip of water. All right. Sheba says, "What more can we do to harness the power of language, inspiring action to better and prevent future genocides?" Here's what we got to do, y'all. I think. Ready? First off, we have to be. We we are always on a knife's. We are always on the precipice of something. We have to be aware of that. You know, we, we can't be dealing in something like a passive piece. We have to be dealing with an active piece. And what that means, this is a word that, or a phrasing that, that might be an introduction for some people. Other people know exactly what I'm talking to. We have to create a condition of constant awareness and communication and love and connection, building institutions of uh, with unifying principles and uh, where we listen to each other and we build from a place of acceptance and love and that needs to be built all of the time there will be constantly people who are and institutions and individuals and perspective and viewpoints that are interested in division that are interested in separating us in different ways in all kinds of different ways for different reasons and different purposes and every single one of those divisions is an opportunity every single one of those separations is an opportunity for harm every single separation is an opportunity for lots of things and this is what I want to talk about in this second part the second part of this the next 20 minutes is a little bit more mystical okay that's the word I'm going to go with it's a little bit more spiritual it's, I'm pointing to something that there isn't a lot of language around and I'm pointing to something that um, you know it's something that is something that I feel like I've arrived at through my own personal experience and different readings and teachings and other sort of disciplines of knowledge that I've been privy to and that I've been passionate about and I've spent some time learning about. So in putting that all together, this is what I think is happening with words and this is why we have to be very, very careful and intentional about our words. This is why we can't even as we exist in a place with free Wi-Fi and you know internet access speeds and all this stuff that this whole precipice of using there's this whole space available to us now that was not available to our ancestors where we can speak freely and loosely and without much effort we can reach thousands of people and that doesn't mean that it's a space to you know that doesn't mean that's what the internet gave us right and it was flooded then with our values at the time, which is stuff like commerce and entertainment. So just because people can use words and it costs less to use words and to spread words, there's still a cost. It costs less in a sense, but there's still a cost. And there's something we have to pay attention to about what words are and what words do. So I think all words were invented. They were born of, out of a need. You should uh, be mindful of people who seem to want to control words and control this incredible power that we all have as humans to create words and to um, and to name things and to name ourselves in a way that serves us. So I'm pointing in particular to like the Ben Shapiro guys and the Daily Wire and Matt Walsh people, you know. Um, Remember just asserting that queer people were just making up silly words 
when in fact they were yeah making up words in order to better describe their expression and their situation and their perspective and that's what words do and that's what words are words have this deep power um, they have a power of separating I talked in the last episode I talked about how like you know so again like being efficient with words and trying to make sure we're using and saying true things more often I could say if you ask me you know how am I doing or what, what was I doing I could say Billy is billying hey what'd you do yesterday Billy I could say uh, Billy is billying Billy, and that would be a true statement, right? Billy is billing, whatever that means. The problem with it is you probably wanted something more than that. You wanted some texture. You wanted to actually, you wanted more than that. So I have to, I have to tell you something more than that. And so we have to recognize that Billy is billing is true. I can say the earth is, is doing what the earth does, it's true. The universe is doing what the universe does, it's true. And you're like, what happened yesterday? I'd say, the universe did what it did. And that would be a true statement. But it's not, it's probably not what you were looking for. Maybe it is, maybe you say, oh yup, yup, the universe did what it did, and that would be it. But if we wanted to have a conversation about what happened yesterday, we would have to zero in on something. We would have to separate. We would have to carve out the universe to zero in on the earth. Zero in on the United States and Baltimore where I'm at, right? If we're talking about, you know, you want to find further what Billy is, what Billy is billying means. You're, zero, you're carving out all these other things in order to point to something specific. And so... And so if you said to me, hey, the people of the United States are having an election, right? Let's say you we zeroed it down to that. You say the people of the United States are having an election. That would be true. That's one of the things that's happening. And you could zero you zeroed in on 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 the United States. You could zero in further, right? The the condition of of the people of the United States in Maryland is different from the condition of the people of the United States in Texas. So you you could zero in further. You would choose a different word there. You would choose, if you wanted to tell me about Texas, you would zoom in on Texas. If you wanted to focus on Austin, you would zoom in on Austin. You focus on a time and a place. And in order to tell an interesting story, in order to make an interesting sentence, you would have to point out, you would have to use words and especially use words that offer contrast. To talk further about Texas, you might need to give me contrast Texas versus something. That's where the value comes from, from, from pointing out Texas. You're telling me Texas in contrast to Louisiana, in contrast to Florida, in contrast to Maine. You talk about the United States, you're telling me about the United States in contrast to Mexico and Canada and the rest of the world. And that's what words are doing. And I, I'm pointing to, and I hope, <laughs> I hope I'm getting there. Let me gather my thoughts for a sec. Depending on my motives and my goal, I might, I, I'm carving up the world. I'm telling you a story about things in a way that is based on my goal. If my goal is to get you excited or to get you angry, and I know you, I know what makes you angry, I can point to a certain specific location, a specific event, give it the specific context, and pr produce that emotion out of you. That's something that words can do. And even, you know, I can, all I'm doing is zeroing in. I'm not, like, the, the world, the world is way more complex than whatever I've zeroed in on is what I want to point out. The world exists and continues to flow. Whatever I've, whatever I've pointed to, whatever I've zeroed in on, 
is still part of a broader thing. So the election for 2024, I can zero in on November 2024 and try to tell a story around November 2024. But would that be a complete story? Isn't November 2024 part of a larger election campaign season of the last year and a half? Isn't this election, the 2024 election, doesn't that rest on what happened in 2020? And Biden, Biden having won, wouldn't it be different? Wouldn't it be a very different set of circumstances if if Trump had won? And doesn't doesn't that election rest on the prior election and the prior legal uh, realities and the prior historical truths between the two parties and the multiple parties and debates and all of this stuff that it's all tied together? That's just in terms of time, it's all tied together. But if I'm talking about, you know, that's just in time. But 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 also, like I said, you're zeroing in on the United States. The United States um, political process and system is deeply tied to the broader global political process and system. The tentacles of the United States empire are far-reaching. And the effects of uh, a political move in Italy, a a far right guy getting elected here in Brazil or in other parts of the world, like that all is connected. They all interplay with each other. The birth rates in another country have connection to broader birth rates and immigration A lot of the institutions we have in this country have a they 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 rest on the assumption of um, replenishing new bodies, new citizens. It's all connected. Everything is all connected. Everything is actually truly one deeply complex thing. The only thing that differs is the story that I'm telling myself and the story that I'm telling you or willing to tell you for a whole number of reasons my reasons my political reasons my personal reasons on why I see things the way I do on where where I choose to focus my attention Like I said, of all the things that require our attention and deserve our attention, where do you put it? It will depend on a tremendous set of factors that are like often outside of our awareness and they're so deeply intertwined with everything else. Everything else. We're experiencing infinity. We're experiencing a powerful thing. This life, this experience is this deep, uh, complex thing, this thing we call reality that um, we only really experience in in parts from our perspective. And that produces incredible, beautiful striation and color and again texture and great gradient of of mosaic of creative output it it necessitates that that's that's a requirement in order to have that beauty but also it produces the potential for conflict and violence and for disagreement and for lack of awareness because again especially if you believe if you've been given a lens about the world that tells you that your perspective on the world is logical and objective and true and that there are no other perspectives worth hearing or, or understanding or that there are no other perspectives, period, that everything else is uh, is made up, that you, you're the, you, you somehow have the, you're the arbiter, arbiter of uh, absolute truth or something, then um, it puts you in a position of not being able to learn 
not being able to deal with reality. You have to react violently towards reality, which is a complex multiplicity of people, cultures, language, ethnic groups. art experience and that mix that mix of it the opportunity to to gain and expand our world through a foreign experience <clears throat> one of the things I think we have to do back to Sheba's question to harness the power of language differently than we typically do is to become aware of how things actually are dependent on each other and to speak about that unifying language if you talk about and the, the cable news people do this all day all oh, the left the left the right the right the right the republicans the republicans and they have all these labels they have all these quick labels because the point is not to produce intelligent viewers the point is not to educate the point is to just crank out quick summaries of things and so you have this willingness to settle for words and labels quickly not understanding that words and labels are themselves constructions there they are they help point to something but at some point they become obstructions themselves to, to seeing what is they are phenomena of themselves, words are. And so talking about the Republicans or the left in a loose and general way, well, the problem is the left. The left needs to, blah, 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 blah. And the left does this. Is bullshit. Well, the left always does X, Y, and Z. If you were tasked with saying only true statements, if you were tasked and serious about being a truthful, consistently true person, you would be a great deal more careful saying things like the left does or women do or men do or Christians do, Muslims do, Jews do, Buddhist people do. These words are, these sentences are inaccurate. You have the right to say them. You have the ability to say them. You have the freedom to say them. They're a reflection of you and your limited. They're either a reflection of you and whatever general bias you're about to say, because you can't say a true statement unless you're about to caveat that. You can't say that group does anything or it's a reflection that you don't understand the value of being more specific and true. There are times when it's fun to do that. There's times when it's like like comedy, for instance. Yo, Sheba does stand-up comedy. And I do think that there's an important space and value in using words in comedy and being able to wrap it up. You get a five-minute set. You know, we have words that we have generally agreed upon. We have, like, little observations that we can make about each other, stereotypes that we can play on to quickly make a thing. And, you know, especially if it's done cleverly. You know, I'm, I'm all for it. Like, you know, in, in that context... Um, it's fine I'm talking specifically in journalism in law and in international relations in these kinds of spaces with humanist humanist spaces where we're trying to ascertain what is real the goal needs to be to use words accurately we need to be accurate and the left the right are a, th when you start a sentence off with that you are quite often you're just you're pointing to something and you're always pointing but it's just it's such a loose thing that you're pointing to that it's not and it's not helpful so to use language to properly bridge this gap we need to be constantly in communication with each other we need to be improving our communication we need to be interested in what is true we need to be interested meaningfully in what is true like put that on the table in a very 
direct and clear way. And when we're interested in that, we realize that so much of the things we typically say, the way we use words, they're not about truth, you know? They're about... The intentions become evident at times when you look at words and how they're used. They're to entertain, they're to inflame, they're to troll people, they're to get... They're to say something very quickly, they're to... to, um, to say something very quickly you know but when you have the opportunity to speak truthfully we need to take it we need to be serious about it and when you speak truthfully for instance the republican democrat divide going back and forth about that republicans and democrats do a lot of uh, bickering and fighting as though they're complete polar opposites and diametrically opposed forces and oh they can't wait to correct the other and fix things because the other side, oh, the other side is the root of all the problems. But they also collaborate. They collaborate a great deal. They collaborate for the debates. They collaborate once members are in Congress. The DNC and the RNC meet to set the terms of different election things. They are, they are one and the same. And if they're not one and the same, obviously there are differences. There are different political uh, things that they differ on, but they are, they work in tandem with each other. And having to talk about that, having to keep that present, changes the conversation. It's no longer a conversation about these massive opposites where every election the world is at stake because, oh my God, look how, (laughs) this has been going on since, since as far back as I can remember, since, you know, Clinton, the other, oh my gosh, this, we're on the precipice of tyranny and everything's a mess and George W. Bush is a monster and an idiot and we have to vote again for these two things. When you, when you, when, when there is a separation that's contrived, when you look closely and speak about the, how they actually interweave, what happens is, that the strength of that separation is diminished, right? You're now talking in a more unifying way. If we can talk about black and white, the idea, you know, black people, white people, sometimes we talk about ourselves as just deeply separate. There's something that white people do and are. There's something that white, black people do and are. And never the twain shall meet. They're just, they're just very different. Um, but we know that's not true. There's no biological truth to that. What we have are different cultural manifestations, ways of celebrating, ways of dancing, and ways of being that don't have a, you know, this property of trying to assess better or worse is a property of language, it's a property of narrative. It's a, it's a narrative property in order to create sentences. <laughs> in order to be able to create a fun sentence. Here, let me tell you. Let me tell you about this thing. And let me point out the sep- separation. Point out the difference. And so we become attuned to difference. We become hyper-focused on difference. We become really skillful at finding difference and articulating that. But we fail to become skillful at finding how we're the same. Not more than how we're the same. How we are intertwined we don't even notice it it's a less it's sometimes you know as far as a headline goes <coughs> as far as a headline goes some civil group or some uh, governing body in some part of the United States is having a good conversation and doing well it's a less interesting headline than if there was a fight that broke out in Congress. That's a more interesting headline. That's where people will go. That's the that's where the attention goes. Than to speak and constantly reinforce the truth of the ways that we interact and are enmeshed with each other. It's more interesting to talk about a forest fire and the destructive forest fire, the contrast between the lush forest before the fire and after, the burning. It's more interesting to talk about that than to talk about every day how those plants and animals in the forest have been working with each other to sustain each other. 
and also the sun and also the rain and the water and the amount of elements at play that keep that forest, that ecosystem together, the amount of insane elements that are outside of our understanding that just operate casually, that keep everyone alive, is ever present. It's just there and it's true, but a feature of journalism is this, a feature of journalism in its current state, in its state as having been set by cable news people and media executives, entertainers, it's around conflict and separation. And so, <laughs> roundabout, I'm getting there, baby. The, 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 the way we do it is to reinforce that, to notice it, to talk about it, to pull it front and center, to give it value, to give it the value it deserves. Say, yo, notice, notice this thing, yo. You out here complaining about this and that. Like I said, we complained. The airplane was 15 minutes late and I couldn't get the Wi-Fi in my bags. It's like, yo, you were in a plane that took you from New York to California in, in whatever, five hours. That's crazy. That's insane. That's insane. Notice that. It's right there. It's a matter of awareness. It's a matter of awareness. And it's a matter of narrative. Awareness stems from narrative. Words, the words we use, the words and words separate, inherently they separate, and we have the power to, to unify them again by being attuned with reality, not the words. Not so focused on the words trying to define genocide but focused on what is happening and saying this is a horrible thing we're going to call it that because we want to raise alarm we want to raise attention we want to set the terms where everyone has to stop right now so that we can chart a different path we're very clear about who the offender is and we're not going to go any further with the nonsense rhetoric about defense and I we must do this and that and everything is justified because we have this and that so in conclusion give me two more minutes in conclusion yo the words we use are super powerful and they are a reflection of us they are a reflection of our feelings and our understandings and sometimes I want to point that out. Feelings and our understanding is not logic. People think that they're logical. Again, saying, I don't want to use the word genocide. It's a feeling. You're driven by a feeling. You're being emotional. You have a feeling and a sense that saying that word puts you in a position to have to call things differently. To You would have to levy a more serious critique against a political party that you don't want to do that to. You don't want to have to construct sentences with the word genocide in it because those sentences will be will compel action in a way that you don't want to have to really deal with. It's feeling first. And then you logic a bunch of reasons why you use other language or you don't look at the subject all altogether. Focus on something else. It's not it has nothing to do with you. But that's all feeling based. I think we have the power to actually commandeer this incredible technology that we have called words and finding ways to use unifying language which is to run counter to everything that we've been taught everything we've had modeled for us in the in some of these spaces um, in the last generation and the reason some of those spaces have built up this way is because they were built for presentation they were built for attention it was an attention economy it was built for for that and where we are now is we're in a in a truth economy we're seeking we we are coming to terms with how silly some of this stuff is and how harmful a lot of this stuff is and how our real value is in our capacity to ascertain our connection and to connect with that um, unifying language.
pull pull up Republican Democrat pull up they're both political parties elite political parties you know race black white like pull up human there's always this other thing you can pull up from and you realize that your fates are intertwined on the question of genocide the people leading the uh, protests and leading the international discourse and leading the effort to call it a genocide and have a ceasefire are Palestinian people and Jewish people that I've seen Israeli people I say Jewish people really is well I don't even know about Israeli let me, let me the, 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 these two groups are two groups that I'm pointing to one is a I mean there's ethnic groups there's religion there's states these are all different ways of talking about these groups but Jewish people are at the forefront of the conversation of calling it a genocide because there's a recognition that our fates are intertwined. Our fates are linked. What happens next is not that this all goes away and disappears. What happens next is we have to reconcile this somehow. This monstrous thing that's happening right now. And... Um, And when the media talks about these two sides because they're cheap and lazy and they're using words to quickly get a title going and they're trying to um, they're trying to play with the language that we're familiar with and they're also setting terms of the language they want to use specifically because they have their biases and their interests in the people who are making sure that the discourse is, is run a certain way. You pull up and realize that those two groups are both human, existing on a on a plot of land, and that there will need to be reconciliation. Recognizing that, recognizing the interactions, the intertwined nature nature of it, the meshing, the, the constant exchange, the truth of our shared humanity, it pulls us a level up from that idiot conversation that cable news wants us to have, which is about two warring sides who can't who can't get it together, who just it just it won't happen. They're diametrically opposed, it seems. These, these things don't allow us to see the texture, the truth of the complexity of the, of the situation in the moment and the history of it. So we have to tell truer narratives. We need to be interested in truth and we have to start telling truer narratives and what there's no better way to do that than to, um, you know, the people telling these narratives need to be in tune with themselves in full. Need to understand their motivations, their fears, their anxieties in full, or else you can't tell a full story. It's impossible to tell a uh, to to tell truth if you're not in tune with the blind spots and the fears that govern the words that you use. This is true on so many levels. Talk to someone from Iran and see how some, some people will say the word, they refer to it Persia instead of Iran. And they're talking about the same plot of land, but that word, if you ask and inquire, you'll realize that there's a, there's a political complexity that that person is in tune with, and that's why they choose the word Persia. Uh, they're talking about political reality and their connection to that versus it on this all this all the time this is what words are so yeah man it's a reflection of us our understanding and our feelings it's a great portal to our to see ourselves actually why am I afraid to use a certain word why am I shying away why am I using euphemism here why am I Speaking more bluntly here. Oh, these are these are who I am. This is my bias. These are, these are my biases. Okay, can I accept that? And then from that acceptance, um, develop an even stronger sense of of 
of reality. Yeah. Because whatever's out there is what out there. Out there is out there. And we are part of it. And the words we use are a reflection of us. It's us. You're telling me what you're thinking and what you're, you know, that's what that is, okay? Anyway, that's it. That's my episode on words. Uh, let me read what Sheba says here. <laughs> da 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 da. Surprise, your best options in the entire country are two men. <laughs> Intertwined, she says. Um, maybe the attention goes where we train it to go because the generative ecosystem story is also super interesting. Palestine will be free and it will be free for us all. Absolutely. Yo, that's the episode, y'all. Thanks very much. Peace and love. Um, respect. <laughs> and uh, I'll talk to you later. I'm going to let us out with uh, perspective one more time. Why not? Let's get it. Hey, yo, what happened, man? Yo, what the yeah. fuck? What's all this? People running around. Uh-huh. I heard some shit happen. Some went down over by the... Yo, yo, what the... What happened, son? This one kid got knocked out. It's all fucked up like a boxed house. Locked doors, windows blocked out. One punch. These tough images cropped out. Flip the kill switch. And all that chill shit, they knock out These dudes got a short fuse like a thought blouse Locked in death to them stop shouts Niggas the type to shoot first, all questions crossed out That little buddy slept bloody in snot mouth Where was y'all at though? Right on the corner by the old food truck Cold, they took his chains and boots off, socks out Head hit like face first, blood on his stained shirt His wallet whipped out, that's pay dirt and Quickly picked up by the same perp People's phones out, now they filming in frame burst. Whole scene sucks, but it's way worse. Little kids watching, now they cursed. Cycles that we live in, it's apes heard, I'm saying. Every day, just another day. Every single day, just another day. Every day, just another day. Every single day, just another day. But then a flare spark, light up. Right there, see the whole thing different. Full view, T, no shade, visual. Listen, look again, breathe, rotate, pivotal. I figure these just words y'all gon' take literal. I rock out mineral. Who wants some bullshit? Minimal. Y'all clowns gon' need prayers after I kill a few. My skills damaging, right down to the ego shattering. You probably not real if you're not a fan of us. I shoot from deep hit, free throw average. I'm stress free. Yes, please, we blow cannabis like Gretzky. I triple check these old analysts. The game's slow, y'all drag on, I dethrone Lannisters. They repo, but it's light work, I'm reprogramming it. Zoom lens got three whole cameras. Life bitchy, cause you suck, probably you can't handle it. We fucking, we looking through a peephole, amateur. Fuck, amateur.